Hi. Today, we're going to be talking about atomic structure, okay? And basically, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about the history and the development of what we now know as the atomic model or the atomic theory, okay? Now, when we last left off, we, were, we know about Dalton's atomic theory. Now, Dalton pictured atoms as being like little tiny featureless spheres, okay? But it wasn't long until, well, maybe about 75, 80 years later, that they started to question whether that was in fact how atoms really looked like, all right? And so it was not until, um, it was not until uh, the 1890s that a British scientist by the name of J.J. Thompson uh, basically showed that atoms contained electrons. And he did this with the use of what is known as a cathode ray tube. Now an electron, remember, is the negatively charged subatomic particle. All right. But before this, they were not even known to exist. People knew about electricity, but they did not know what was in it. Now we know that that's electrons. Now, a cathode ray tube was basically, cathode ray tube was basically a glass filled tube, all right? That, excuse me, a glass uh, vacuum filled tube, excuse me, that um, was, uh, had a very small amount of, of gas inside of it, and it had a large, all right. um, uh, it had a large, uh, basically, battery attached to it. That's what this is, the source of electrical potential. And it had um, wires attached that had electrons, I mean, that had electricity flowing through the wires. And at one end, they had a plate here, and another one, they had a plate here. And when the electricity was running, a beam of light shown from one and uh, from one electrode to the other. Okay, and basically, they dis uh, he discovered that through uh, very careful calculations, that this beam was in fact made up of itty bitty tiny particles. All right, and he also showed that they were uh, basically. Um, that the particles were negative in charge, all right? So if you can imagine, I'm gonna go back a little bit, I have a blank screen, and so imagine here that we have the beam. Now, when he came up and he took, um, he, he was playing around with it, he was experimenting, and he took a negatively charged item, all right? Uh, for example, like, you know how if you can take a balloon and you rub it on your head um, and then it can stick to walls and stuff, you're putting static electricity in there. And that actually becomes negatively charged. So he took a negatively charged item and he put it next to the beam. And he found that that beam bent away from the negatively charged item. Then he took a positively charged substance all right, and put it near the beam, and he found that the beam bent towards it. All right, I'm sorry, but is it me or does that just look like a, uh, um, a female cyclops? Anyways, uh, the point is that um, because it attracted, it was attracted to a positive charge and repelled by negative, as you guys learned from middle school, um, opposites attract and like charges repel. So since it was repelled by negative, the, char um, the items themselves, the particles themselves had to therefore be negative, okay? So uh, what we have here is an example of a modern day cathode ray tube. Okay, now some of you guys may recognize this. This is called a television, all right, or TV. Now I know you're looking at why is it so wide and how come it has such a rounded screen on the front. 
Back in the day, this is what televisions used to look like. I know it's crazy, all right? But this is actually used the same technology that J.J. Uh, uh, Thompson used when he was doing his cathode ray tube uh, experiments, all right? This is basically nothing more than a glorified cathode ray tube, all right? Now, if you can imagine, the tube is, instead of being tube-shaped, it's kind of a cone shape with one end being here and the other end being out here. And what happens is, um, at this end, it shoots the electrons, boom, against the screen. And you can actually see that's why they're rounded, because it's that vacuum tube thing, all right? And whenever the electron hits the screen, it causes a momentarily poof of white to show up, all right? Now, if, um, when we turn this on, all right, when we turn this on, we get um, static, is what we used to call it, or snow. Now, normally, around right here, there is an electromagnet, all right? And normally, when it gets a signal, either through the cable, or through an antenna, or through satellite, or whatever, the signal sends electronic impulses to the television, which then turns the electromagnet on and off in a very specific pattern. And it can cause the electrons, as they're shooting towards the screen, to veer off, and it causes them to hit very specific parts of the screen, thus creating the picture, all right? So that's how televisions basically work. Now, this particular television is not getting a signal in, and that's why the electrons are just going all higgly-piggly all over the screen, all right? But we need to pause. Ready. All right, so what I'm going to show you here is what happens if we bring a magnet up against this, okay? Because right now they're going all over the place. The electromagnetic in the back is not getting any signal, and therefore it's not causing a specific picture. But if we take a relatively powerful magnet and we put it against the screen, we can see that it is causing a distortion, all right? Whoa. It's like the 60s, man. It's like Berkeley. So what we have here is a distortion that causes um, the electrons to basically veer off based upon the magnetic rays or the magnetic um, field that is given off by this magnet. Okay. So it's basically the same thing that uh, uh, Thompson was doing, but using a modern television. All right. So just give you guys a little bit of an example of that. Thank you very much. So that was for J.J. Thompson, and from it, he was able to propose a new model of an atom. Now, this model became known as the plum pudding model, okay, uh, basically because it looked like a, uh, a dessert uh, from the time, okay. He was English, and the closest thing we have to it, think of it like a fruit cake. We have a cake type thing, and you have a whole bunch of um, instead of fruit, dried fruit, you have a whole bunch of electrons embedded in it. Um, think of it like a chocolate chip cookie dough model. It's probably how we would call it today. So he saw it as a spherical cloud of positive charge, and he saw that it had electrons in it. But the whole thing was um, vaporous, as it were. It did not have any solid structure. Now, this model lasted, let's say, couple decades, all right? And then it came to another scientist by the name of Rutherford, okay? And he did an experiment called the gold foil experiment. And this turned the atomic model on its ear, all right? Now, basically, what we have here is, imagine, if you will, a, a piece of radioactive material, and he put it inside a lead box that it had only one little window in it, right here. And basically, the, um, radi the radioactive material shot forth alpha particles, all right? So he shot them in this direction. Now, alpha particles are, um, we now know, are little bundles of protons and neutrons, okay? But all he knew was that they were positively charged, they traveled very fast, and they could uh, travel through most materials that he was playing with. 
And he was trying to figure out uh, basically what it was able to penetrate. Now he shot it at an incredibly thin piece of gold foil. It's this thing right here in the middle. And when he shot it through it, he wanted to see basically whether it would pass right through or if it would bounce off. All right, that was the basic thought. And in order to determine which path they took, uh, he did this several times. The first time he did it was in a special screen uh, that was used to detect the scatter of particles. Uh, we can now do it also in what is known as a cloud chamber, because then you can actually see in a cloud chamber the little path that the radiation takes. So he did it several times. The first time, though, was with this screen. And what he discovered blew his mind. Okay, basically, his proposal, his his thought, was that it, uh, that the particles would travel straight on through. Okay, not hitting anything, maybe being deflected or uh, attracted by the negative electrons, if the plum pudding model had been correct. What he did see, all right, as I said, totally blew his mind. If you look back here, uh, you can see that most of the particles did go through. All right? That's why you saw a large number of hits on this side. Some of them got deflected a little bit, but then he saw something crazy. All right? He saw that some of the particles got reflected all the way, like, like bounced off, ricocheted. Now, just to show you, just to give you guys an idea of just how crazy this was, Imagine, if you will, that you take a piece of tissue paper, all right, like you, you know, wrap presents with, you hang it up, and you shoot it with a machine gun. Most of the bullets go through, but every now and then, one ricochets off. That's how crazy this was. And he did very careful calculations. He did very, very careful um a measurements, and he was able to figure out exactly how large of this, basically he determined that there had to be some sort of hard center, maybe a you know, solid center, all right? And that's what was causing the, uh, the particles to ricochet, all right? In other words, he discovered what we now know as the nucleus. And by doing, as I said, very careful calculations, he was able to figure out that most of the particles went straight on through, okay? But every now and then, since some reflected or ricocheted, he counted, calculated basically the percentage that went through compared to the percentage that ricocheted, and he found the size of what he called this nucleus, okay? Um, so hopefully you will be able to do the same activity all right um, when we do the atomic nucleus activity all right but where he used uh, radiation and um, um, basically a radiation gold foil and a nucleus we're going to use a pencil a piece of paper and we're going to try to figure out the size of a penny but that's in the that's in that activity now Basically, once we had this concept, we developed, uh, he was able to develop a brand new model for the atomic structure. He showed that, um, that mo excuse me, atoms have internal structure. All right? He discovered basically the nucleus, which is a relatively small, dense center of a positively charged atom. All right? Then he discovered later on um, and other scientists helped him, that the nucleus itself was made up of even smaller particles, protons and neutrons. Protons right, are positively charged subatomic particles located in the atomic nucleus, whereas neutrons right, are um, subatomic particles found in the nucleus, but they have no charge, okay? Um, they just kind of sit there and take up space, all right? Reminds me of some students I know. 
Uh, also reminds me of a really bad chemistry joke. Um, so a neutron walks into a bar, asks the bartender how much for a drink. The bartender looks at him and says, for you, <laughs> no charge. Yeah, chemistry humor. Can't get enough of it. Anyways, um, he also figured out that the electrons, instead of being part of the positive nucleus, since they were negative, they had to be somewhere outside the nucleus. All right. He also realized that with his calculations, that atoms are mostly empty space. All right. All this area here is where the electrons are all scattered about. All right. And it basically, the nucleus has most of the mass, the vast majority of the mass, but very little volume. Okay. It's very size, uh, very small compared to the size. Just to give you guys an idea of the relative scale, imagine a professional football stadium, something like Qualcomm Stadium, okay? Imagine that you have an atom the size of that stadium. The nucleus would be about the size of a softball, a baseball, and the 50-yard line. And the rest of it, all of that space, would be empty, except for itty-bitty um, fruit fly-sized electrons that are flying around at, um, at almost light speed, okay? That gives you an idea, hopefully, about the relative size of the nucleus compared to that of the atom, all right? So Rutherford is the one who introduced the concept of the nuclear atom where the new atom has an dense center of positive charge surrounded by moving electrons. Now, further research by other scientists further refined the atomic model. Now, electrons travel randomly through the cloud very quickly. They don't orbit, okay? They do not orbit. Sometimes you might see um, um, atoms being depicted with like a little nucleus, and, and the electrons are kind of flying around it in these predetermined like paths, like track runners running around a track. Uh, they don't, okay? Instead, they occupy these three-dimensional regions called orbitals, where they are more likely to be found. Now, they're completely random, though, right? almost completely random. They're mostly random. <clears throat> and they tend to fly around, go wherever they want. But these three-dimensional regions around them are where they are most likely to be found. All right? And so there's the highest probability of finding the atom. Let me get rid of the ink. All right? And so they're, they're, they're the ones surrounding it, okay? And these orbitals are themselves found in concentric layers around the nucleus. Now, these layers, these layers are very, very important. They're known as the energy levels. And electrons occupy these various energy levels. An electron, once it's in an energy level, that's where it is. And it depends on how much energy it has. The further from the nucleus it gets, the more energy these electrons have, okay? And as you'll find out by doing the, uh, um, well, basically, they have very specific energy levels, okay? And the electrons, here's the really cool thing, electrons that absorb energy can jump to a higher energy level, okay? So these energy levels are like layers, you know, like uh, atoms are like ogres, they have layers. And an electron, if it gets energy in the form of uh, electricity or, or heat or something like that, it can jump from one energy level to the next, okay? Now, this higher energy level is called an excited state. Now, when they fall back down, okay? So basically, the ground state, let's say the electron is supposed to be in this level. It jumps up to this level, okay? Dances around for a little, woo hee ha 
and then immediately, almost immediately, split second later, falls back down to its ground state, all right, back to its original energy level. But the energy you did have gets released in the form of a photon of light, all right? So light, light is emitted. That's that's why anytime you get something really hot, like the uh, the wires in a toaster, okay, and it starts to glow, the reason why it starts to glow is because you've gotten the electrons all excited, and they jump up and they fall back down. They jump up, fall back down, and they keep emitting light. Okay, now. The truly crazy part is this. Each element's electron structure determines, you know, since, sorry, since each element has a unique electron configuration, each element gives off a unique color of light. All right, pretty crazy, huh? And this, these different colors of light are actually useful for identifying what the element is. And this is probably the most important part. So you may want to, you know, when you're writing this down in your notes or whatever, you're going to want to make sure you have this. Maybe put a little asterisk, whatever. This is very important. It is the number and configuration of electrons around the nucleus that determines an element's chemical properties. All right? So if you have any questions, make sure you ask during tutorial. Thank you very much.